Right, welcome. Uh, uh, my name is Martin Knapp. I'm a Professor of Social Policy here at LSE and uh, I represent the Social Policy Department and the Personal Social Services Research Unit that's organising this session as part of the uh, LSE Festival. Uh, delighted to see so many of you here. Thank you very much for that. And um, if you're sitting near the back, right on the aisle, be ready to move across if people come in late. So just to be prepared for that. Now, um, we've got four really good speakers tonight. Uh, they're each going to talk for 15 minutes. Uh, and it uh, would be great not to take questions immediately after them, but to wait until we get to the question uh, and answer session, the panel session later, so they'll come up here at that point. Uh, and what I'm going to do is introduce them uh, one by one as we get to uh, the, their, their slot. Um, can you switch your phones to silent? Um, and <coughs> hashtag is there if you're going to be tweeting. Um, make it positive uh, uh, and, um, and tell late people, like latecomers to come in quickly. Um, so uh, we've got, uh, I'm going to go in the order, it's not quite there, be Paul, then Nathan, then John, then Sarah, uh, as I say, 15 minutes each. So I think without further ado, I'll go to our first speaker, who is Paul Farmer, who's been Chief Executive of MIND, which is the leading mental health charity working in England and Wales. It's been there since 2006. Paul is Chair of the Association of Chief Executives of Voluntary Organisations, which is the leading voice of the UK's charity and social enterprise sector. Paul is also a trustee at Lloyds Bank Foundation, which invests in charities supporting people to break out of disadvantage at critical points in their lives. Uh, Paul was chosen, I'm not sure how to say this now, was chosen as the most admired charity chief executive, I hope you're going to admire him tonight, uh, in the third sector's most admired charities award 2013. So over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Martin, very much indeed. I, always, uh, I think I need to take that most admired thing off my, uh, off my biography. I, it always feels like a one Britain's got talent or something, uh, something like that. Um, thanks for asking me to come and tell, talk to you today about, um, about... I'm going to talk today about television uh, in the main, uh, in the context of mental health and mental health depiction. Um, and I suppose the, the context for this is that part of our role at MIND is to try to get mental health talked about in the media and most importantly to try to influence how it's discussed so that reporting and depiction of mental health is accurate, sensitive and fair. And we know that media reporting and dramatic portrayals of mental health are incredibly powerful in influencing the public. And when done well, the media can be a tremendous tool in raising awareness and challenging attitudes and helping to dispel myths. And it can give people with their own experience of mental health problems a platform to speak out at. And it can offer insight for the public uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding more about what they do or don't know about mental health problems, particularly through soaps and dramas, and that's what I'm mainly going to talk about tonight. Sadly, though, we also know from research that the media still relies on a lot of negative stereotypes when it comes to talking about mental health, and sensationalist journalism when, that overplays an association um, between mental health issues, and particularly mental health and violence, um, can... Um, uh, can really kind of promote fear and mistrust around mental health uh, as an issue. And using inaccurate terms like happy pills instead of antidepressants or split personality instead of schizophrenia uh, widens that gap of understanding about mental health. So I'm going to talk a bit about the work that we and the Time to Change campaign have been doing uh, around tackling some of these issues in the context of uh, mainly, as I said, television. Why is this important to us? Well, this is important to us because of the whole issue of stigma around mental health. And uh, these are kind of fairly familiar figures now, uh, I imagine, to you, because we've been talking about the impact that stigma has on the lives of people with mental health problems for several years now. Um, and uh, we know that people often talk about the stigma of mental health problems almost being worse than the experience of their own men of the mental health issue, the mental illness itself. And of course it has an impact on all aspects of, of, of our lives, whether it's um, uh, finding a job, having a relationship, uh, taking a part in uh, our society uh, and in our community. Um, and we also um, know that when we asked people, our, our own supporters, what they thought about media coverage on the whole, people thought that um, portrayal, did think that portrayal of mental health problems in the media was not good. 
Uh, in fact, uh, this survey, which we did a couple of years ago, found that 80% of people found the portrayal was poor, and only 1% of, of people with their own experiences said they felt the coverage was good. Um, and so this kind of issue of getting it right is quite a big, uh, a big challenge for us in terms of the work that we do at Mind. Um, and one of our supporters here says, I'm sick of the media scaremongering everybody into thinking we're all monsters when a good percentage of people with mental health issues are kind, loving human beings who are being denied the chance to lead a fulfilling life due to ignorance and stigma. And um, here are three uh, media stereotypes, which are uh, taken from films. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about film later on, so I'm not going to talk about them particularly, but they will be, uh, they will be quite familiar to you, I'm sure. Um, uh, the knife scene uh, in, um, uh, in Psycho, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, um, uh, Silence of the Lambs. Um, and at time to in the Time to Change campaign, we run by ourselves and Rethink Mental Illness, to address the issue of, men, of discrimination and stigma, one of the things we've done is taken quite a kind of different way of getting people to think a little bit more about the subject of, uh, of, schizo of schizophrenia and stigma. And I'm hoping this is going to work. a lunatic with a knife on some sort of rampage. My name is Stuart and I was diagnosed Ooh. with schizophrenia 12 years ago. People like me with diagnosis of mental illness face stigma and discrimination every day. Luckily for me, I had the support from friends and family who helped me lead a full life. Visit timetochange.org.uk and find out how you can help end the stigma. Stuart's an incredible guy. Um, I've spent time, quite a lot of time with him. He's just, he, last year he went to Everest Base Camp um, as part of his own recovery journey, if you like. Um, and um, and it, that, that ad has now also been taken by our partner campaign um, in the States and is now being remade for a US, a US audience. So how, how are we getting on? Are we improving in this issue of dramatic portrayals of mental health? And the good news is that uh, the report piece of work we did with the Glasgow Media Group suggests that fewer characters with mental health problems are being portrayed as violent. Um, and I should have said that um, uh, those of you if who remember the, the programme ER, uh, we counted that ER had 28 um, examples of people with mental health problems in their series, uh, the vast majority of whom were basically plot devices, and they were nearly all violent. Uh, so, so, you know, there were some real issues that, that needed to be, have needed to be addressed, but the good news is that there is some uh, positive progress, and encouraging number of storylines are featuring likeable characters, managing their illnesses and living productive and valued lives. Um, so a good example of that is uh, Ray Earl from the E4 comedy drama, my now Channel 4, My, uh, my Mad Fat Diary, whose own journey, I think, was really, uh, is, is really powerful. Um, we've also recently questioned soap and drama audiences about the impact of television on their behaviour. Um, and uh, amongst those respondents um, uh, who've experienced a mental health problem, 25% of people said that seeing a character with similar issues encouraged them to seek uh, professional help. Um, and a quarter who have a loved one, friend or colleague with a mental health problem felt prompted to contact that person after seeing a mental health storyline on TV. Um, and interestingly, men, who are historically very bad at reaching out for help and support, are more likely to do this than women. Um, we also know that uh, from our own experience of working with a, a media advice service that we run at Mind, um, that people quite often referred on to us, and after an EastEnders storyline, a uh, number of 18 to 24-year-olds calling a mental health helpline seeking help for bipolar disorder doubled, and Steve McDonald, who we're just about to talk about in a second, in Corrie, um, when his storyline was shown with the link to the Mind website, we had 78,000 views to our information pages. 
And we know that the, the, uh, the appearance of sensitive um, and appropriate portrayals in soaps encourages people to seek help and talk more openly about the issue of mental health problems. So here um, is Steve. Uh, if you're a Coronation Street fan, Steve McDonald uh, are from Coronation Street um, uh, is currently uh, in uh, experiencing uh, his own depression. Um, and our media advisory team, which consults, has been consulted on over 60 drama storylines over the last couple of years, um, has helped and supported the script writers to make sure um, they get this right. And in this case, and it's a good example, we will match the character with somebody with their own lived experience so that they can spend time really understanding what it's like to live um, with depression. Um, and as Stuart Blackburn, the producer of Coronation Street, says, um, the audience are feared, fear that the Steve they loved is gone for good, but I've told the writers his DNA hasn't changed, his head might be taking a battering, but he still has the wit and good days and bad days. So here's, uh, uh, for Coronation Street watchers and non-Coronation Street watchers, um, Steve going to the doctor to get his diagnosis. I'm a nightmare to live with. And that's everything. I mean, I don't know what Mrs. C to me, especially now we're not, you know, I mean, we're not, you know, um, no libido. I mean, we should see her. She's, she's gorgeous. She could have any bloke she wanted. And if she regresses, I'm getting back together now. I think in the interest of time, I'll leave it there, but please do watch uh, that, that whole uh, uh, track, which we'll make available uh, afterwards. Here's some of the examples of the uh, responses we had from Twitter uh, to the way in which the uh, depression is being portrayed, broadly speaking, very um, positive. Now, this is also important because of the impact of uh, media on suicide. Um, and good research uh, suggests that there is a, there's a real responsibility for broadcasters in making sure that the depiction um, of uh, suicide is handled incredibly sensitively and incredibly carefully. Um, uh, and so th this data, I think, tells its own story. Uh, and we work with the Samaritans very closely to ensure that uh, program makers really get this right. Um, finally, uh, the work we're doing is uh, really to promote and encourage the best possible practice in terms of uh, good quality support from program makers, drama, news, current affairs, um, and all aspects of television. And um, we know that the strongest way of doing this is to give people with their own experiences a voice. So we uh, provide support to a number of media volunteers through our media team to really get that, uh, that opportunity to talk in the first person about their own, their own experiences. Uh, it's putting me out of a job as chief executive of mind. Increasingly, people are uh, wanting to hear from people's own, uh, own voices, own experiences. And we think that's incredibly important. Um, and uh, great news to see Channel 4 doing a campaign in this area. BBC Three have run a programme. Here's some, some of the, a series of, of programmes, some of the programmes that they ran um, on this. And we reward the best of this in our Mind um, Media Awards uh, to celebrate those actors, uh, programme makers, journalists and bloggers who are helping to dispel the myths around mental health and reduce discrimination. Um, and here's a short, to end, a short film that talks about the work of the, uh, of the Mind Media Awards, which celebrated its 20th anniversary last year. Um, keep your eyes out for a couple of quite familiar faces. So the Mind Media Awards are in their 20th year this year. I think it's an incredible opportunity for us to look back and reflect on the progress that's been made in the depiction of the issue of mental health in the media. I um, had bipolar and had a nervous break, and that ain't a nice thing to do. Some people don't fall through, some people do. We have discovered that the number of young people being prescribed antipsychotics has rocketed in recent years. Sorry. What's happening there? Um, let's try that. <laughs> I 
This is where I give up. Changes. I mean, and TV dramas evolved. It was very little on mental health. It was very concentrated on sensationalism. Oh, I think there's been a marked change in the way mental health issues are covered by news and current affairs programmes. What I think the statistic is one in four of us going to be affected by mental health, uh, and therefore that's one in four of our viewers. The fact that people are much more able to talk about mental health issues openly is actually being led by the fact that the media has uh, made it easier to talk about them. It works because people talk about telly, they talk about their favourite programme, they talk about their favourite character. If last night was... <laughs> In the interest of time, do you want okay. to...? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <coughs> Right, uh, let me just say, I forgot to say, and Paul's comment uh, reminded me of the need for this. Uh, we will, we're hoping that there'll be a video uh, version of this available on the website in due course, so you'll be able to get that. And uh, what we can make sure is there's a link to these different uh, clips so you can see those. So I'm now delighted to uh, uh, welcome our second speaker, who's Nathan Filer, who's the author of The Shock of the Fall, uh, which is winner of the Costa Book of the, Year, Book of the Year Award in 2013, the Betty Trask Prize in 2014, and Popular Fiction Book of the Year at the National Book Awards uh, last year. Um, it has been translated into 27 languages, but Paul's, uh, Nathan's going to speak in English tonight, I believe. So, uh, Nathan worked as a mental health nurse for many years, and in 2014 was named as the Nursing Times Nursing Leader for influencing the way that the public thinks about mental illness. And he lectures in creative writing at Bath Spa University. So, over to you, Nathan. Thank you, and uh, hello. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm happy to follow Paul as well. I find that uh, really fascinating and um, I think there'll be some overlap in the, in the things we talk about and in the way that I uh, tried to portray a, a, a young man with mental illness in my novel. And um, It's my novel that I'm going to talk about uh, and my work as a nurse, as a mental health nurse and how these two things sort of came together. Uh, ten years ago... I was just completing my undergraduate degree in, uh, in mental health nursing and I was on a placement at the time. The, the way these uh, courses work is you spend some time in the classroom and some time uh, in, in the wards. And I was on a, a placement at a ward in Bristol called Clifton Ward, which was an adult open acute unit, a uh, 20 bedded unit for people with uh, very serious mental disorder, a range of mental disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression. <laughs> Uh, some people who were detained, some people who were there informally, but all of who uh, were perhaps too unwell to be in the community at that time and needed that, that kind of more intensive uh, care. The wards closed down now, uh, as so many wards have. Uh, this is part of a very worrying trend of thousands of bed closures which we've seen over the past uh, few years and perhaps something that we'll talk about in the Q&A later. Um, I was walking home from a uh, late shift on Clifton Ward and uh, a couple of sentences started to, to play around in, in, in my mind. Uh, and I can still remember those sentences, uh, not least because I've written them down. Uh, <laughs> they were, I had no intention of putting up a fight, but these guys weren't to know that and nobody was taking any chances. I had no intention of putting up a fight, but these guys weren't to know that, and nobody was taking any chances. I had no intention of putting up a fight, but these guys weren't to know that, and nobody was taking any chances. It was quite a long walk home. I had no intention of putting up a fight, but these guys weren't to know that, and nobody was taking any chances, round and round, uh, in my mind. And I didn't realise at the time that I'd started writing uh, my novel. 
Uh, I knew that I wanted to. I was already very interested in, in, in writing, but I, I, I didn't know uh, that this was the beginning of it. It was just those two sentences going round in my mind and an immediate sense of the character uh, of the person uh, who had uttered them. And I gave him a name straight away. Uh, I called him Matthew Holmes. I called him Matthew uh, because that was the name my mother was going to give me before a last-minute swerve at the end of her pregnancy uh, to Nathan. Um, the, the reason she did that, um, as, a, as a brief aside, uh, her, her mother, my grandmother, who appears in the novel, and if, if any of you have read it or go on to read it, uh, she's uh, the, the sort of real-life Nanny New uh, character. Um, the the, the real-life Nanny New, my grandmother, uh, was Irish-Argentinian, and, uh, and she couldn't say uh, Matthew, uh, she would say, Matthew, uh, Matthew. And as my mum got more and more pregnant and more and more hormonal, uh, <laughs> this, was, this was driving her crazy. Uh, and, and so she called me Nathan, and my grandmother spent the next 32 years calling me Nathan. It was a, <laughs> it was a terrible strategy. Um, uh, and Holmes, because I was reading a, a, a book by the author A.M. Holmes uh, at the time. Matthew Holmes, 19 years old, a chipped front tooth, uh, a tentative diagnosis of schizophrenia, and a dead big brother uh, who refuses to stay dead. I thought, oh, well, there's something there, maybe. So I got home, uh, and I loaded up my computer, and I wrote out those first two sentences. I had no intention of putting up a fight, but these guys weren't to know that, and nobody was taking any chances. And, and then I wrote and rewrote and tweaked a scene depicting a group of uh, psychiatric nurses restraining and medicating Matthew on an acute psychiatric ward. And I drew upon what knowledge uh, I'd garnered as a, as a mental health nurse. I was a, I was a third year undergraduate, remember, so I thought I knew a lot more than I did. Uh, <laughs> but I drew upon what I did know in order to get the setting right, uh, in order to get the terminology uh, right, some of the jargon, uh, in order to try and capture something of the, of the strange uh, incongruous calm that, that, that often uh, goes hand in hand with these otherwise very violent situations. Um, and I wrote that out and then I deleted it, uh, which is why uh, if you have read the book, you've, you've never read that scene. It never made it into the novel. Um, in fact, very little of what I wrote in the, in the first draft of, uh, of, of this book made it into the, uh, into the novel that ended up on the shelves. Uh, except Matthew Holmes. And I grew to know him. I didn't know how long uh, I, I would be spending with Matthew. I, I thought, oh, well, I'll knock this out in a year. But actually, it took, it took many years. And I would grow to know uh, Matthew Holmes very well. I sometimes think I know him as well as, as, well as I've known anyone, which I appreciate is a, a, a slightly odd notion for, uh, for, for a person that I, that I, that I made up. But I, I do know him. I know his hopes and his fears and his failures. I know the strengths in him that he can't see. I know his family. Uh, and I know his friends. He was a remarkable constant uh, over the years of writing uh, that followed, which isn't to say that he didn't change at all. Uh, he, he did, but, but possibly uh, no more than I did. What changed a good deal more was the plot uh, that I was attempting to, to thrust upon him. And, and, and this is where my uh, talk connects a, a, a little bit to, to, to Paul's, because I was making uh, the mistake when I started writing this story uh, that we've seen uh, in, uh, in much of the media, a, a pretty inexcusable mistake for a mental health nurse. I'm, I'm glad I saw the error of my, my ways, but uh, perhaps trying to do something a little bit too sensational, trying to write a, a kind of plot-driven novel. It was about a young man who was, um, uh, he, he was psychotic, he heard voices, he fell in love with one of his voices, and, um, and it turned out that this voice represented the daughter of a guy who'd sort of kidnapped his brother, and it was all very, you know, it's a, uh, as I say that, I can imagine it's selling very well, but, um, uh, but it wasn't sitting right with me. And by this time, I was, uh, I was no longer a student nurse. I was, I was working as a staff nurse now, and I was on, uh, on Clifton Ward, the, the, the ward that I've been training on. Um, and I was meeting, you know, hundreds of people uh, with schizophrenia. Um, 
you know, this is, a, this, this is an illness that affects, uh, as I, I think uh, was uh, referred to in that video, 1% of the, of the adult population. It's, a, it's actually a very common uh, 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 disorder. And I was meeting, uh, and I was meeting their families. And slowly, incrementally, uh, it dawned on me that actually, you know, I didn't want to, to, to be another person who'd, who'd perhaps propagated some of the, the, the myths uh, around this stuff. And, and, and probably uh, a simple story uh, about a young man and, and his family was enough. Now, you know, I, I need to be very careful here. It's not to say uh, that I necessarily got this right, and, and uh, I'm always very aware uh, when I talk about this book, that I'm very fortunate. I'm not one of the 1% of people who has uh, schizophrenia. Um, and, and so it was always, for me, uh, an imaginary exercise. And of course, I couldn't begin to describe everybody's experiences. And, 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 and I suppose nobody could. There are as many uh, experiences of, of, of mental illness as there are people who, 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 have, uh, who have these illnesses. But, um, but I could be uh, sensitive, and I could be uh, sensitive to, to my character and get close to him. And at the very least, I could uh, I could not propagate some of the uh, uh, some of the nonsense that we see uh, uh, around this disorder and others. Uh, so the, the the penny dropped, uh, and I decided. I mean, other things were happening as well. Of course, I was uh, I, I was reading. I was meeting different characters in fiction. Uh, I might see if you're awake now. I met. Um, uh, I, met, I met Frank Coldame. Can anyone tell me where I met Frank Coldame? You didn't know it was going to turn on you like this, did you? <laughs> uh, I'll give you a clue. It's uh, uh, Ian, yep, at the back there. Factory. The Wasp Factory, well done. So, congratulations. Oh, yeah. nobody, nobody ever gets that one, that's excellent. Uh, I met, uh, who else did I meet? I met Christopher Boone. Curious incident. Curious incident. Uh, I met uh, Holden Caulfield. Uh, I met uh, Vernon Godlittle. You get, you get, yeah, you get no points for that. Um, you know, I was, me I was meeting these characters, and um, when I think about those novels now, and I loved those novels, and when I think of them now, I can't, um, I can't really remember what the stories were. I can't, you know, I was thinking of this plot that I was trying to kind of press onto my characters, and actually, I can't remember what the plot of any of those novels was, but I do remember. Uh, the, the young men at the at, at the centre of them. I remember the um, I remember the people, and you know I think so often actually when uh, people write about uh, mental disorder and when it's uh, p portrayed in fiction, the temptation for writers can be to uh, write the illness first and then sort of bolt on. The, the character afterwards, almost uh, almost as an afterthought, and of course all of those characters are such rounded uh, characters, and, and they're eccentric as well. And I and, and I'm drawn to uh, uh, I'm, 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 I guess I'm drawn to that kind of eccentricity. So I want to uh, I want to share a little bit uh, of Matthew's voice uh, and let him talk for a bit, so I won't keep waffling on. Um, I'm just going to share a very short chapter with you. Uh, which comes about 30 pages into the book, but hopefully it won't ruin it if anyone does uh, choose to read it. The only thing you need to, you need to know is that um, Matthew is physically writing his story. So unlike lots of uh, first-person uh, uh, narratives where we accept the words kind of land on the page somehow, in this case, uh, 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 Matthew writes his story out. He attends a, a, a day centre called Hope Road Day Centre, uh, which he attends every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, based on a real day centre in Bristol, which is also closed down, um, uh, very sadly, or sort of the, the, the occupational therapy aspect of it has. He's got access to a computer there, uh, and he writes his story on, on this computer. Uh, this chapter is called Hypotonia, Noun, A State of Reduced Tension in Muscle. There was the shock of the fall and the blood on my knee, and Simon carried me all the way back to the caravan, all by himself, without any help from anyone, even though it half killed him, but he did it anyway. He did it for me, because he loved me. I already told you that. And then I said there is a proper word for weak muscles that I would look it up if I got the chance. And possibly you forgot all about it, but I didn't. I didn't forget. There is a nursing dictionary kept in the office at the top of the back staircase, and I could see it there on the table. I could see it when I went to the office to ask if I could go on the computer for a while to do my writing. It was really funny, though, because the girl I asked, 
the young one with the minty breath and the big gold earrings who is forever trying to read over my shoulder, she just kind of froze. She totally fr She was the only person in the office and she totally froze as if the nursing dictionary contains all these secrets that patients aren't allowed to know. Seriously, she couldn't even open her mouth. Then a really funny thing happened. Do you remember Steve? I only mentioned him that once. He was the one who gave me the teaching session on this computer. I said I probably wouldn't mention him again. Well, he came into the office next, and the girl turned to him and asked really hesitantly whether or not patients could look in the dictionary. That is how she said it too. She said, um, um, is it appropriate for patients to borrow the dictionary, Stephen? And you'll never guess what he did. He stepped past her, and in one move, he threw the dictionary back through the air like a rugby pass right into my hands. And at the same time, he said, what are you asking me for? He said it just like that. He said, what are you asking me for? Then he turned to me and winked. But it wasn't even a quiet wink, because he made a little clicking noise with his tongue, as if to say, you and me, kiddo, we're in this together. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if I'm explaining it very well. But you can see why it's funny. It's funny because the girl didn't know whether or not I could even look in the dictionary. And then it was doubly funny because Steve made her look really stupid by being all casual about it. But the really funny thing, the thing that makes me laugh out loud, the really funny thing is that Steve made that little clicking noise with his tongue and winked at me as if to show that he was on my side or something. Except you're not on my side, are you, Steve? Because if you were on my side, you would have just handed me the dictionary like a grown-up. Because if you make a big fucking gesture of it, Steve, then it becomes a big fucking deal. But that is what these people do, the Steves of this world. They all try and make something out of nothing, and they all do it for themselves. Simon had hypotonia. He also had microgenia, macroglossia, epicanthic folds, an atrial septal defect, and a beautiful smiling face that looked like the moon. I hate this fucking place. So that's, um, uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so, so I'll wrap up, but um, uh, that's uh, Matthew. And I sort of, uh, I guess I, uh, the point I wanted to make is I resolved to uh, tr try and let him lead the way, um, which isn't to, to say, you know, that he kind of wrote, I was sort of just a passive observer and he, and he wrote the book for me. You do, you, you do sometimes hear authors talk about that, don't you? You kind of go, oh, well, no, the character just came fully formed in my life and I just uh, <laughs> followed them through the pages. And I, I think, uh, good for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that wasn't really my experience at all. It was still really hard work, but I guess it stopped, um, feeling so much like a writing exercise, and it felt more like a, an acting exercise, like an extended role play. And I got to know Matthew by spending uh, eight hours a day in his, in his company for, for a really long time. And we would pace the paving slabs in my back garden uh, with a cold mug of tea and a roll-up cigarette. And, uh, and I didn't even smoke, he made me start. And um, <laughs> sort of muttering a few different versions of the, of the same sentence in order to, to, uh, to get to the truth of him, I, I suppose. And, um, and as I say, I've come to, um, I've become very fond of him. I think uh, he has lots of attributes that I would like to have. I think he's very brave uh, and humble and kind. Uh, he's stoic. Uh, he's also conflicted and angry and damaged. He's got a pernicious disorder which affects every decision uh, that he makes, uh, and yet he never lets it define him. And I don't think that comes as any surprise to, to people who uh, know people who have experience of mental illness or know people who have, but, um, but I think it sometimes comes as a surprise to people who know it only through, uh, through fiction. Um, so that's what I wanted to say, and I'm really uh, pleased to be able to share Matthew now. I like uh, reading that little section and sharing him with people. Uh, it felt quite strange uh, when, after all these years of, of writing the book, I kind of finally uh, let him go. Uh, and put him out in the world, but I also feel very proud to, to share his story. So to paraphrase a line that never made it into it, uh, I have no intention of putting up a fight. Uh, and I look forward to speaking to you in the Q&A. Thank you.
you very much, Nathan. That's excellent. Uh, just to say, I think Nathan's uh, be signing books afterwards if you want to read more. Uh, so I'm going to hand over now to John McGowan, uh, who's a clinical psychologist. Uh, following many years working in acute mental health wards in the NHS, he now works on the clinical psychology training scheme uh, at the Salomon Centre for, for Applied Psychology in Kent. As well as conducting research into self-harm and suicide, he is currently editing a new British Psychological Society report on depression. He has written for The Guardian, The Health Service Journal, and blogs regularly. And if you're not uh, steeped in English culture, this, uh, the play on words wouldn't perhaps work, but he writes regularly uh, this blog called Discursive of Tunbridge Wells. So uh, over to you, John. Thanks. Um, Tell you they've oops. seen it. <laughs> we can, you can get it on this. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was very moving, uh, Nathan. Thank you. It's a very hard act to follow. Um, okay. I, when this came up, I had a chance to talk about films, which I really love films, and this seemed like a really excellent moment to try and bring together some things that I was interested in. And there are an awful lot. There are an awful lot of films out there that reflect themes. The title of the meeting involves the word madness. There are quite a lot of films out there that involve that kind of concept. Obviously, Paul Farmer's been talking about this notion of mad, bad, you know, mad being a shorthand for bad. And I'm not going to say more about that because I think that's been pretty thoroughly, uh, thoroughly covered. What I would like to talk about, though, is films. I'm really going to talk about one specific film for a bit that involve not necessarily mad equals sick always, but mad, some more, a, a greater focus on the suffering of people having destroyed or unusual experiences. Now, some of these things may be a bit overdrawn. Not everyone may like them. There may be other films that aren't on that list that you do like. I've been told that already in my first rehearsal of this talk. Um, and I'm going to talk about this particular film for a few slides. Some of you may recognize this. This was a film called Silver Linings Playbook, which was a really big film about two or three years ago. Now, whether you liked it or not, it really attracted a huge amount of comment and analysis um, all over the internet, all over the newspapers. It was really thought about and discussed, whether it was a good depiction, a bad depiction, whether, you know, how nuanced it was. Um, and it seemed to me to be quite an, it's a very Hollywood film, but it, it struck me as also quite an interesting one about our culture, current cultural moment and how we think about these things. Okay, uh, it basically concerns this character, the younger man there, played by Bradley Cooper, who plays a, a character called Pat, who we find him in a psychiatric facility. He's in there partly because he's uh, beaten up a guy who he found in flagrante with his wife. And... Um, he has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Now, there's certainly uh, a number of, uh, I'm not saying this is universally approved of this portrayal at all, but there were certainly some quite positive comments about this portrayal in a number of quarters. These quotes are both from, are both from psychiatrists. Um, now, I think that for me one of the interesting things about this was that this character was explicitly offered to us as mentally ill. And I'm going to think a little bit about the pros and cons of thinking about experience in terms of illness. Paul Farmer's given quite an upbeat appraisal of illness. I'm going to give maybe a slightly less upbeat appraisal of seeing things through the kind of lens of health and illness. Uh, but it's a complicated issue, and I'm not going to necessarily take a strong position either way. Okay, the character in the film, he's not a terribly sympathetic character, and I think he's played very, very well as a not sympathetic character. But his illness is offered, his label of illness is offered to us as a way to open up our compassion for the character. And this seems to me to be a very, very contemporary view. Where I think we are, and I think that the Time to Change campaign is actually a pretty good example of this, is the notion that rather than thinking about madness, we think about sickness, we think about illness. Um, one of the reasons that we think about that is that it's not blaming. There's a quote here from Alistair Campbell on Twitter. This pertained to a story involving Stephen Fry. Uh, two or three years ago, Stephen Fry had talked about having suicidal feelings. There was a little bit of comment going round, oh, well, he's very rich and successful. What on earth does he have to be down about? And Alistair Campbell is saying, well, what would you have to be cancerous about? You know, it's very much, you know, quite, well, Alistair Campbell, quite aggressive. Back off, he's, he's ill. Now, I like a lot of what Alistair Campbell writes, but this, I think, was very revealing about a sense of 
illness and not blaming somebody because they are sick. And that, I think, is very much the underlying message in the Time to Change campaign, which you've heard about. Um, these problems are as real as a broken arm. Now, I think that there are some upsides. There are some really, really significant upsides in terms of seeing experience in this way. I give a talk, I give a pub talk around and about uh, in pubs usually in the southeast, and one of the examples I give is the notion of shell shock in the First World War. And it seems to me that in this and in so many other ways, the notion of being you know, traumatised rather than you know, weak or cowardly or whatever pejorative labels were attached to people in that era, being traumatised struck me as a huge advance on that. And there are many, many other examples of that. So the notion of you're not bad, you're also not weak. Sickness is actually a, a counterbalance to that. Um, they can be um, uh, useful in focusing uh, treatment, that can be drugs or medication, other therapies as well, um, psychotherapies, etc. Uh, I'm not going to come off as being you know, necessarily particularly anti-drugs, actually. Um, also, I think for many, many people, the notion of having an illness can be a profoundly validating um, thing to make sense of difficult, painful, unusual experiences. And having a diagnosis can really, it, it, it can have downsides, but it can really capture and validate something. And I've had many, many conversations with people over the years where they feel that that is, is very true. And indeed, some of those Twitter comments in Paul Farmer's talk, I think, were perhaps indicative of that as well. And also, it opens up a lot of other things. Whether we should have to be sick to open up these things is a, is a whole other question. Things like benefits, taking time off work. You can't have a day off work because you're sad. You can't have a day off work because you're sick. Um, so I think that are, there are these and many other upsides to a sick label. However, I do think that there are also some problems and some complications with purely holding things, experiences like this through a lens of illness and wellness. Now, a lot of these things got, an, got quite a big airing a couple of years ago with the publication of this book, which is the, called the DSM-5, published by the American Psychiatric Association. It's a big compendium of mental illnesses and disorders. Um, and one of the main issues that people were getting exercised a bit about it around the time of its publication, this is the fifth edition, was its ever-increasing scope. It started in the 1950s and it's been getting thicker and thicker and thicker and subsuming more and more experience under the rubric of illness. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? I'm not necessarily sure. Uh, however, the increased scope did raise concern. Alan Francis, who's the editor of the previous DSM, just the previous edition, said that his publication was a sad day for psychiatry. And he's certainly not a kind of anti-illness headbanger, really. The, the, the underlying concern for him and for many others, though, was a notion of over-pathologizing human behavior and experience. Now, articles like this in Slate, abnormal is the new normal. Why half the US population will have a diagnosable mental disorder? There was a lot of this stuff around at the time. And I say a lot of these issues were, were pretty hotly debated. Now, I think there are a number of significant problems and complications. Uh, one that gets talked about a lot is the notion of reliability. Do experts agree about the application of these labels? Reliability is actually kind of pretty poor compared to physical health. Um, also, the notion that you don't really necessarily have biological substrates, biological correlates in the same way that you do with physical health problems. In fact, the National Institute of Mental Health in America stopped funding research using these categories because they, they did not see them as being sufficiently physically grounded. This gets huge, huge, very impassioned debate a lot um, when this issue is discussed. Another issue that comes up kind of quite a bit is the notion of a certain sub subjectivity of social norms that work their way into these classification schemes, these illness classification schemes. The big example that people often use is homosexuality. It was only removed from the DSM in some form in 1986 as a mental illness, in 1986. And I, I, I had to look that up and I was quite shocked by how late that was. This on, this, on the screen, this is a much earlier um, example of runaway slave syndrome. Um, the guy's a doctor, so obviously he's um, obviously he knows what he's talking about. Why else would slaves want to run away? They must be sick. Must be mentally ill. Um, 
Now, the final thing I'm going to talk about a little bit this in the, in the next couple of slides is the notion of utility. And a colleague of mine says, well, you know, you, you don't get blamed for having, you know, it's less blaming having a diagnosis of a mental illness or disorder. But is it a great chat up line? Is I've got schizophrenia a great chat up line? And this is something about the utility of these labels for people. Now, again, in Paul Farmer's talk, I think we've heard something about the upside of the utility of those labels. And I don't want to deny that there certainly seemed to me a hell of a lot better than a very blaming, very, ne very negative, you know, psycho killer sort of narrative. Um, however, some of the early work that's now coming out a a assessing time for change is suggesting that they are actually also associated with some pretty negative connotations as well. You may not be seen as weak or bad, but there are issues of hopelessness, issues of difference, otherness, alienation. I think we like to think that, you, that holding those up as a kind of shield against stigma works, but the initial, the initial assessments of that aren't all that positive. Also, there's a huge amount of other service user-related literature where people find these labels horrendous, hopeless, negative view of self, feelings of being defective. So it's not an unalloyed good. I'm not saying it's not a good in some circumstances, and in some cases, maybe many, but I'm saying it's not an unalloyed good. Um, also, there's a whole issue of um, the notion of compulsory powers, the fact that you can be detained um, against your will and treated against your will, even if you're deemed to have capacity. That's a pretty unique situation. That's a whole other talk, the, the rights and wrongs and pros and cons of that, but I just don't want to let it go in this one. And then the final um, thing, which I think is a big thing for me, is the notion of where you, where you look for the causes and solutions to distress. Do you look inside people's heads, you know, I'm depressed, so everything's bad, or I'm depressed because everything's bad. Now, if you're looking at illness, if you're looking at illnesses, I think even with the best will in the world not to do this, it automatically takes you into a place where you're, you're looking inside people for, for what's wrong. So what happens to you know, life events like divorce or unemployment, homelessness, loneliness? Um, poverty. What, what, what happens to these? Uh, what happens to these things? And I don't think there's any easy answers to this particularly. I think that we're so concerned with saying this can happen to anyone that it's quite easy to overlook the fact that these things may happen to you a great deal more frequently if you're poor or if you've had traumatic life events. I can understand that the intention behind that message, but it does become quite distorting. Okay. So are the downsides represented in films, just to bring it back? Not so much, I think. Uh, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jack Nicholson, who was on earlier, this, this comes up. He plays a, a guy who is a, uh, in the prison system and is put into a psychiatric facility. And it's a very, very negative uh, portrayal. I'm not necessarily sure it's one I agree with at all. Nurse Ratched in that picture is a bit of a celebrated movie baddie. It's grounded in the kind of anti-psychiatry movement, which you don't hear so much about these days. Um, R.D. Lang, Thomas Saz, people who had a problem, I think a lot of it was about this kind of idea of subjectivity of mental, um, subjectivity of mental illness uh, as being something that you got for violating social norms. Um, the system, the mental health system is portrayed as controlling and persecutory. Nathan Fowler talked about um, cutting of psychiatric beds. I have to say I feel supremely ambivalent about that, hugely ambivalent. In one way it's a bad thing, in another way I think maybe the mental health system can do better than psychiatric beds in a lot of circumstances. Um, the kind of things that are portrayed in a very negative light in, the, in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, electroconvulsive therapy, psychosurgery, which is thankfully off the table, electroconvulsive therapy is still very, very much with us, and detention, compulsory, compulsory powers. Um, okay, Silver Linings Playbook, again, more contemporary moment. Do these things get any play? Because it superficially seems quite a pro-illness film, you know, illness is a kind of shield against stigma in the film. Uh, Pat, the main character, is in fact shown rebelling. He's shown rebelling. He doesn't take his medication. He sort of palms his medication sneakily. Uh, so how does he recover? Now, for those of you who haven't seen the film, I'm afraid I'm going to spoil the ending completely at this point. Um, <laughs> I'd say that he, has, he is uh, rescued through entering a dance contest. I love films about dancing. Um, and also, I told you it was a Hollywood movie, he is saved by the love of a good woman. Um, <laughs> So would we want to see a film about being saved by medication? I don't know. That might work for cancer. I don't know. 
but that's, that's something that speaks to the ambivalence of our current cultural moment. And I think this film, it's, an, it's a Hollywood film, but it captures something about that ambivalence. Okay, so where are we now? What does it tell us where we are now? I think the idea of illness is becoming very, very dominant in the way that we think about um, distressing and unusual experiences. That has its advantages. I don't want to minimise those. <laughs> However, I think it also has serious limitations and problems which don't necessarily get a lot of play. And for me, I think personally, the danger is of seeing things only through that lens seems to me to be very limiting and miss quite a lot that's important. However, this prompts very, very passionate debate, more so than almost anything else I've ever encountered in my uh, career in mental health as an issue. People get very, very wound up about it. And, uh, you know, I sometimes feel a bit like that uh, when I encounter those, uh, those debates. Um, okay, so just some further info at the end. Uh, myself and a colleague give a talk where we try and walk through the pros and cons, all sides of this issue, which I say we give around pubs mainly, it seems. And some of these issues um, here, uh, some of these authors here, I think, have written very interestingly on this from a slightly more questioning, uh, slightly more questioning viewpoint, but I think they all bring something very thoughtful to the table. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much indeed, John. Um, right, and our fourth speaker, Sarah Carr. Uh, Sarah has a background as a senior research and policy analyst in mental health and social care with a focus on service user participation, personalisation and equality issues. She runs her own independent mental health and social care knowledge consultancy. Most recently she worked for Sky, the Social Care Institute of Excellence, as a senior research analyst. Um, as co-chair of the National Survivor and User Network and a member of the editorial board of the journal Disability and Society, Sarah has a particular interest in mental health issues and is a long-term user of services. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. I put the mad one on last. <laughs> um, well, I'll just get my other way. No, that way. Here we are. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about madness in the movies today, following nicely on from uh, John's presentation. And I'm going to take a look at madness and mad houses. And I'm, I'm using those terms because I quite like them, um, and I, I'm, I recognise that some people don't. Um, so I'll be looking at cinematic representations of mad people and the places they inhabit and what they seem to represent for audiences going to the cinema. Um, and as has already been revealed, I'll be doing it from the perspective of somebody who's been mad themselves. So, first of all, I'm going to briefly reflect on what cinema-going audiences seem to need from film when it comes to the topic of madness. The way it's been depicted in cinema and the film genres it appears in must say something, I think, about the social and psychological need to collectively process madness in some way. So, sorry if the resolution isn't great on some of these, so right from the beginning, we had madness in cinema, even before we actually had sound. Um, and I'm going to point to a couple of examples that have struck me from early 20th century cinema. Um, both of them are firmly in the expressionist or avant-garde tradition, and for that I suppose read weird. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER You might have seen this film, uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, uh, which was made in Germany in 1920. And I've read accounts that argue that it's uh, one of the first true horror films. Um, it's about a doctor, a sonambulist, a sleepwalker, and, of course, murder. Um, and here's a spoiler. Sorry about this if, you've, if you haven't seen it. Uh, that's already a spoiler, because that's one of the final scenes. Um, I shouldn't have told you that. Um, the narrator of the film, it turns out, is in an asylum where Dr. Caligari, this gentleman in the pinstripe trousers, the penguin suit in the middle, is the psychiatrist. So this is uh, madness in, in a film and a madhouse in a film. That's a horror film and firmly in an expressionist genre of film. Another 
highly stylized film about madness and madhouses uh, from the same period, from 1926, is a film called A Page of Madness. Uh, it's a Japanese film. Uh, similarly, the kind of interiors of the asylum here are quite frightening. They're quite almost hypnotic in some cases. Uh, as you can see, the people are behind bars. They're clearly distressed. They're incarcerated. And there's a sense throughout the film, because there's a lot of kind of expressionist visual experimentation, uh, that the director sort of wants the viewer to experience <coughs> something like the mental chaos and the chaos inside uh, the hospital. But there's a, there's a humanising element too, as the narrative is actually about a retired sailor who works at the asylum, so he can actually care for his wife who's in there. Um, and you can, I think you can watch that online fully legally because it's now out of copyright. Um, so it can be argued that both these films belong to an emerging horror genre. Now, in the horror films of the 1970s, which we all know and love, lunatics and psychos take to the centre stage along with zombies. The mad person is the object of terror, the madhouse a place of popular dread. The madhouse is essentially sometimes a prison and it appears in, in some films as being worse than a prison. So asylums are places of dread and terror where people can project their fears about loss of control, deprivation of liberty, uh, torture and loss of identity. So here's a, a classic um, of 1970s horror film, Halloween. Uh, made in America in 1978. And in Halloween, as any of those of you who've seen it, Michael Myers uh, escapes from Smith's Grove Sanatorium. Uh, up the top, uh, on, see if I can use the pointer. No, oh, no, there he is. No, I can't. Um, is uh, Dr. Sam Loomis, who is the hero psychiatrist. Uh, and there below, is young Michael Myers uh, in his cell without his William Shatner mask. You'd never know it was him. So um, Michael has committed a crime, but psychiatric hospitals appear as worse than prisons because actually you don't have to commit a crime to end up there. Or in the case of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, as John mentioned, uh, criminals can fake their way in there. Uh, they can be in there instead of uh, prisons if they like. But as Randall Patrick McMurphy, who's played by Patrick Nicholson, uh, uh, discovers um, asylums are also worse than prisons because you're surrounded by mad people and are subject to treatments like ECT or, ultimately, uh, lobotomy. And it's possible to speculate that the Rosenhan experiment of 1973 may have affected popular imagination and cinematic storytelling in the period. The research involved normal people uh, feigning hallucinations and being admitted to psychiatric hospitals as having mental health problems. Um, and it's the idea of being sane in an insane place came from. And I think films really do play on this fear. And then, even in another very well-known horror film of the period, there's Paul Reagan McNeil in The Exorcist, who's really neither sane nor mad, but she's possessed. But nonetheless, neurological investigations add to the tension and terror in the film. And this is a very well-known uh, piece of the film, because everyone thinks of her head turning around and her vomiting. This happens at, at the beginning, the kind of secular exorcism, where uh, she goes uh, for neurological investigations, and they're pretty terrifying as well. And here's the, and I'm going to try and pronounce this properly, pneumoencephalography scene um, in the film, where she's had uh, air or gas injected to her brain for the purposes of imaging. So all in all, it's about the horror of completely losing it that people were very scared of. 
So cinema has acted as a means for people to confront the mad person of whom they're terrified, the mad house where they're terrified of ending up, and madness, the state they're ultimately terrified of. Well, I went mad and ended up in a madhouse. Uh, and needless to say, when it happened, cinema hadn't really helped me with my expectations. <laughs> so, what does it mean for me, as a mad person, seeing depictions of madness and places you end up in if you're mad on the big screen? Well, as a child, uh, when Whoopi Goldberg first saw Uhura in an episode of Star Trek, she said to her mum, I just saw a black woman on television, and she isn't a maid. <laughs> Given the discussion so far, can the same thing be said of mad people in the movies? How do I see myself on film? In general, uh, cinema can be very important for role modelling and identity formation. It can show you that there are others like you if you're marginalised and isolated in a particular minority or have particular experiences that set you apart from other people. But it's, that's quite difficult if you're looking for shared experiences of madness or mental distress. You can see people who might look like you outwardly, who might live like you, who might even behave like you, but all these are portrayals of external things, which, of course, cinema does incredibly well. But can films show internal experiences? Could I find people in films who feel like me? When I was recovering from a major episode of bipolar disorder, I watched films a lot. Uh, there wasn't much else I could do to distract me from my thoughts. I couldn't read. I didn't go out very much at all, apart from to my local community mental health team. Um, and films allowed me to be immersed in a story, to be distracted in that way, and also to be in company when I couldn't actually be with people in real life. In a way, the kind of act of, of watching films and being involved with the narrative and the characters became part of a kind of recovery. But sometimes uh, there was a deeper dimension to that, and I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, Rachel Perkins, who is an academic and a, a clinical psychologist who's also had experiences of mental health problems herself and colleagues, have said of mental health recovery that it's a personal journey of discovery that involves making sense of and finding meaning in what has happened, becoming an expert in your own self-care and building a new sense of self and purpose and discovering your own resourcefulness. So recovery is truly defined includes coming to terms with what's happened to you and making sense of what you've been through. It can mean forging a new identity or recovering an identity. But it can be very difficult to make sense of an experience you can't really speak about or describe in words. However, I found on a few occasions uh, in films I was watching, I had a, a flash of recognition in a particular scene where I identified not with the person or the character themselves, but with something that was being conveyed about how they were feeling at that moment in the film. Um, I don't know if this has come out particularly well, but one such film um, was uh, called In My Skin. Um, it's a very candid and arguably extreme uh, exploration of distress and self-harm. Um, at the time uh, when it came out, uh, film critics placed it firmly into the horror genre. You can see there's a continuing theme here. Uh, one even calling it a hardcore horror sensation. Um, uh, it's a French film, um, and I think it was, it was quite bloody. Um, and you could argue that it had elements of what's known as the Grand Guignol, uh, the, the theatre of blood tradition. But to me, uh, as someone who was self-harming quite a lot of that time, the woman who wrote 
uh, directed and played the role of somebody who was obviously using extreme ways to con control her mental states, was saying uh, to audiences, uh, this is what it's like to be me. This is what it's like to feel the way I'm feeling. And the audience, in that sense, were being invited into the skin of a self-harmer. And obviously, it was really quite horrifying for some, but I recognised myself there and how I felt, which was a pretty rare occurrence. So I'll, I'll, I'll spare you uh, uh, the gore and the theatre of blood, which is very much part of, of, of this film. Uh, don't watch it if you're of a, a nervous disposition or dislike blood. Um, but I'll show you one of the scenes of, of dissociation in the film that was particularly affecting for me because one of my experiences at the time was dissociation. I really wish this thing would work, but I, I, you might be able to see uh, to the uh, left of the screen uh, the character, uh, the lead character in question is sitting there um, and her hand has come off on the table. That's, her, that's what she's seeing, that's what she's experiencing. Nobody else can see it, but that's what's happening to her. That's her perception of what's going on. Um, and I thought, oh my God, that's really <coughs> what dissociation is like. And I'd never seen it before. Um, so she's at this business lunch, and her hand is becoming detached uh, from her arm, there it is. It's on the table. She's like, oh my God, my hand is on the table. Um, and she ends up uh, stabbing her leg with a fork to cope with the experience because she's sitting at a table with colleagues and she's trying to carry on as normal. So this was in in incredibly affecting because it wasn't the use of the horror or, or the style uh, effects uh, and the blood and the scenes of self-harm that made the film uh, so shocking to me. What was shocking was in this moment was almost to feel understood. So to the, the question I began with, can cinema help people make sense of their experiences of madness? Can it help people make sense of how they felt? Can they see other people on screen? feeling like they, they do? Um, can it be part of recovery? I'd argue it could be, and it can be, but it can't be prescribed. It can only be discovered. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah, uh, and thank you to our speakers. Now, we've got our speakers up here. Uh, we've had four lectures. Um, we don't want a fifth. Um, what we want is some short comments, if you want to make comments or questions. But um, we haven't got a lot of time. Uh, we've got a roving mic or two. So if you want to put your hand up, uh, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, please do go ahead now. So there's one up there I can see. Camouflaged jumper. Um, and there's one here for next one there. OK, so. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for a, a fantastic talk. Very, yeah, just superb. Um, I work in service user-led uh, area within mental health in uh, personality disorder, and it's one of the most stigmatized um, fields still. Um, and I find that uh, as, a, as a service user myself who works in the field, I found myself sat in rooms with professionals um, you know, uh, senior um, psychiatrists and so on, who forget that I'm a service user. And the amount of prejudice that can still exist at very high levels, um, talking about us as them, and really, really <laughs> just using such incredibly disparaging language, um, just reflects um, just how far we've got to go. But we have come a huge distance. Um, I just want to know what um, the panel generally think about um, service user involvement in, in sort of developing services. Um, that's it really. I don't, I don't know if that's a specific question, but um, yeah. That's a very... Okay. Anybody want to... I'm not going to ask every panellist every time, but anybody want to respond to that? Service user involvement. What, what, what do the panel think of service user involvement in services? 
Uh, oh, well, <laughs> Sarah first. Sarah I think obvious been... answer for me, I don't think you can develop services without involving services. <laughs> That's my short answer. <laughs> and and uh, I completely agree with that. And I'd actually go further. And I think in this context of talking about and un helping other people to understand what you're going through, you should really involve people with their own experiences, with, involve service users in, in all aspects of uh, of the way in which not just services but actually the depiction uh, of people with, with a mental health problem is, is created and generated. Mm -hmm. And of course no one individual, no one individual can, can represent the totality of people's experiences but, um, uh, but that involvement is really, is really critical uh, in terms of helping pe other people than people who aren't service users to understand it. You know, this, the kind of mantra of nothing about us without us is a pretty solid, feels to me like it's quite sound, really. Yeah. Nathan, John, do you want to say anything? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd echo that, of course. Actually, in a previous job, I worked as a coordinator um, for service user involvement in the mental health research network um, in, in Bristol. I mean, that's a kind of nationwide thing, but um, uh, for the West Hub. And I think, um, so the idea there was to, to try and get more of a service user voice in shaping the research that happens in, in, in mental health care. So I think, uh, I think it's absolutely vital. I think the, um, the problem we have um, is actually making sure that the, you know, the principal investigators, the chief investigators, the, the research staff, of which, of course, we would hope that service users would be a part of that and senior within that. Mm -hmm. The issue is when uh, these investigators are actually doing it as a bit of a tick box in order to get their funding, you know, that, yep, we've ticked that, we've got the, we've had a meeting with a service user, and I think um, uh, that, that's the issue, really, that it needs to be part of the culture, that, no, this isn't a tick box, this is really important and, and should be guiding the research, and that's my feeling, anyway. Um, just a few really uh, quick points. I totally agree with what Nathan Filer has just said, actually, and I think at all levels, service user involvement can be absolutely transformative um, and a wide range of views. Um, I do think, just in terms of what you're saying about very negative and prejudicial comments, I, I, I personally think there's a danger of seeing people as the sum of their label rather than the totality of their experience and the richness of their experience. Um, also, uh, slightly more controversial, I got into a bit of hot water uh, three or four years ago, maybe a bit longer now, for writing an article saying that it was quite difficult to take issue with service user views face to face in, in meetings. Um, and what was concerning, I got into, you know, I, it was interpreted that I didn't want to hear from service users. What my concern was was the notion of professionals just going off down the corridor and sort of, you know, rolling their eyes to, oh my God, so and so is sort of gone again. And I suppose that I feel that I would like service user involvement to be on a much more equal footing with everyone else's contribution so we can have a full, proper, honest, grown up discussion about what everyone says. And also that professionals as well aren't just locating everything over in people who are wearing a service user hat as well. But, you know, because professionals are service users and cares too a lot of the time, and I'd like sometimes them to be a bit more open about that. Okay, very good. Um, here is first, so yes, please. Um, hello. I uh, just want to say I really, really enjoyed all of the talks that you gave. I thought the brilliant points were made. Um, John referenced Silver Linings Playbook as an example out, that was out recently of... Um, a kind of Hollywood representation of mental illness. Um, I just want to say one of the things that I really liked about the film was actually the character of Tiffany and her perception of her own mental illness and also how she takes charge of her own um, getting better in a sense. Like she is the one that seeks out the dance and she seeks out the exercise in a way to help herself recover. Um, one of the things that's also good in the film is that she's unashamed of her illness. And I think that is something that is definitely lacking in a lot of literature and art and um, media around mental illness is the idea of, I'm proud that I'm dealing with this, not suffering that I'm dealing with this. And I just wanted to put to the panel, do you think this is something that writers uh, shy away from? And if so, why? Well, um, I'd slightly question that the character in that film, the female lead in that film was portrayed as having an illness actually. My memory is that, she, it's a couple of years since I saw it, but my memory is that she was bereaved and extremely sad and that was almost enough really. I, I quite like the notion that, you know, I, li I did like the portrayal of, I did like the portrayal of her. Whether writers shy away from that, I don't know if I could comment really. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know the I don't really know the film actually, but um, 
Uh, I think that uh, you know writers have a responsibility to their to their characters, and I think as I um, uh, sort of said a, a little bit about in my talk, one of the I think I think the concern is when uh, writers writing about someone with mental illness kind of as, as as I was saying kind of writes the illness and then sort of tacks on the the, the, the personality. So I think. Um, uh, it, you know, if writers are, are true to their characters and see those characters as full rounded people that, like, like, you know, it, of course, actually in the throes of a very, very serious uh, m mental illness, and may maybe Sarah will have some, some comments on this as well, perhaps it can be, uh, I'm sure it can be the main focus in, in a person's life, and actually can, that illness can take over a person's life, but, um, uh, but it won't be the whole of their lives, and I think that that's uh, what writers have a responsibility to get to is the uh, is the rest of the person as well, as we all have a responsibility to see. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree that you know, when, if you're depicting somebody with a, a, a mental health problem, it it's something that might take over their life every now and then. It, it took over my life for a little while. But um, it's much more positive to see uh, how somebody can recover their life after that and uh, live, live with it, live with a long-term condition, um, if that's the way uh, they see it. And, and that's one of the things where I think TV, and particularly soaps and continuing dramas, gives you the opportunity to actually play out that longer story, mm. which obviously mm. you don't get in a film or a, an individual book. So uh, if you, for example, follow EastEnders, the, the Slater family, in fact, which has a kind of, uh, uh, where there's both mum, Jean, and uh, Stacey had experience of, uh, have, have had it received mental health diagnoses, um, uh, you know, you were, you were able to see their characters not be permanently um, uh, in, in a state of kind of psychosis or, you know, if, if you like, but actually you saw them ebb and flow and they had good days and bad days and they had good, they had good phases, good long periods where their mental health was barely referenced at all and I think that's that allow, the, the longer term programming allows for that to happen. In a film, it's often much harder to do that because you don't, you really haven't, you haven't got the, the, the pre-story and you haven't got the, unless of course you're going to have many, many sequels, uh, you very rarely get the opportunity to play that, to play that through. Okay, I've got one here and then one here, so this one and two, so yes. Yeah. One. Um, I'm interested in what you've been saying on many levels, and it's very hard to know what to concentrate on first. I'd like to take issue with John McGann on his interpretation of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, I remember the book much better than I do the film, and it was a revelation to me, that book, because it seemed to me to be about insti institution, you know, the way we become institutionalized in our organizations. And, you know, ma madness in that is just a metaphor, really, for the fact that we live in repressive liberal societies which are trying to pretend they're democratic when they're not and the key figure is not the guy the mental pit is the, the big Indian who tells a story it reminded me a lot of myself at that age it was, was he autistic or what he was in the mental house but he learned the only way he could survive repressive liberalism was to keep his trap shut and he learns in the end he learns from the mistakes of the other guy whose name I can't remember I remember he escapes and he captures his authentic voice so it's very much about that to me, and the film might go off in a different direction. But what I'd really like to say to you is, because I had to go to Thailand two years ago when my daughter went missing, and when I eventually found her, she was in a hospital raving mad, and it took me seven days to get back, back to England, and I phoned ahead and said, get the mental services ready for her. And she went in there, and she went through all the processes of mental health, all the DSM terminology that you were taking the piss out of, excuse my language, was brought up. One person told her she was bipolar, another one said she had a personality disorder. It went on like this. She violently denied, and I mean physically violently denied, all these attempts to label her. And it went on and on for a long time, her becoming more and more violent and abusive to every medical health doctor who came near her. And in the end, what struck me was she was suffering from trauma. She'd been traumatized. And then it struck me that we're all traumatized. A lot of the time we become traumatized without knowing it. And we repress it. And nobody allows us to acknowledge that we're traumatized. I mean, women are traumatized all the time by the intrusion of the male gaze, aren't they? Let's face it, that is a kind of trauma. And if you suffer it enough, you can suffer from a form of madness. So thank you for your time. 
Any comments would be greatly welcomed. Okay. <laughs> Panelists, comments. Well, this conversation is already showing that uh, 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 it, observation and interpretation of what you see will vary hugely from uh, from, from, from from individual viewers' perspective. So that I think that's a, I think that's actually wholly healthy, and it's encouraging. If it encourages us to have a conversation about the nature of mental health in our society, then that can only be a good thing because it's, it is it is getting us to talk about this in a way that uh, way back in 1920 uh, there was no discussion. So uh, so I think this is this is hugely uh, hu a hugely positive. Uh, positive point, and I think it also, I suppose, reminds us of the uh, of the perils of, um, of, of of requiring everything to be absolutely 100% accurate. Because in the eye of the beho in, in the eye of the viewer, you won't necessarily catch all that nuance. Uh, you you will receive an impression. Uh, you you receive an impression of a character who may or may not have a mental health problem. Uh, you, you you receive an impression of somebody's own experiences being uh, you know being very different. Some of some of which will have a uh, rightly have some kind of uh, illness label attached to it, others, uh, others won't. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really great conversation for us to be having. Okay. Uh, can I just make a quick comment? I wouldn't at all disagree with your um, interpretation of One Full of the Cuckoo's Nest, actually, um, at all. I think that's actually a really good interpretation, one that I, one that I agree with. Also, I would, just, I would slightly dispute though, that I was taking the piss out of DSM terminology. Uh, I think it's, it's overextended and sometimes we apply it when we, but you know, I'm not at all taking the piss out of it. I mean, you made so many points and um, uh, I suppose to pick up on the trauma thing, and I mean, you know, can only really can't even begin to imagine the trauma that you experienced in going through this with your, your daughter. So tra trauma there is, as, as well. And I think, um, I mean, you're absolutely right that, you know, behind so many of these uh, labels and so many of these illnesses is, is trauma, you know. And we see, you know, in my work as a nurse, I would see again and again and again that, you know, people who are very unwell, that we would, you know, start to speak to them about events from their childhood and, and, and so forth. And, and, you know, often there were, you know, very horrible things there um, and of course all mental illness is exacerbated by by stress and and, and times of stress so I think um, uh, yeah I mean we could talk about this all, all day but but certainly uh, uh, that word trauma is very very important and I think you're right to highlight it so. yeah I, I'd certainly agree there I mean there is a debate to be had and that's emerging I think in in mental health around uh, the question of uh, asking people not what's wrong with them, but what's happened to them. Mm. Why aren't they in that state of distress? And that, you know, we, it, I think the mental health services need to be much more sensitive to people's history of trauma and their distress may be a response to that trauma. And also from a, a user perspective, how some of the psychiatric system as it's as it's been constituted and is still constituted in some cases, can be re-traumatising for that individual when they're actually, they need help and support. Yeah. 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 Chuck and I completely agree with that. Yeah. Thank um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, question here. Uh, most impressive, I've just got the, the, the three main political parties' leaders are all in recent months have made statements about significant mental health. As many of said, it's the number one health priority of our time. The next priority for the next Labour government. So it seems that mental health is moving to the print of the centre of political debate. And I wonder whether you, or, or all members of the panel, just have a few any words to say about how you think that will influence um, political debate in Parliament outside with uh, politicians. OK, very good question, Dwayne. Also, uh, mental health moving from the fringe to the centre of party political or political debate. So um, who wants to lump, jump into that one first? So. Uh, okay, um, so we do quite a lot of work on this. <laughs> um, um, uh, yes, is the short answer. I think there's no doubt that it is moving into the centre of the political debate. I think the real challenge here is about turning rhetoric into reality. There are far too many people who tell us that their experiences of mental health services are inadequate and not what they need. And we know that, and that doesn't, it's both within the NHS but also other aspects of government policy, particularly uh, we've campaigned very strongly on the issue of uh, the impact of welfare reform uh, on people people with mental health problems. Uh, so uh, I think it is uh, an opportunity for every single one of us in this room to take the chance of a democratic engagement to ask questions of all 
our candidates uh, uh, about what their views are to turning the rhetoric into reality. And if you'd like some help on how to do that, a very quick plug, please do go to the MINE website, which has got huge amounts of uh, information and material to ask candidates. And we do think that this is a genuine, this is a genuine conversation that I do think politicians want to engage in. Uh, but I think there are some difficult parts of that conversation about how you turn what, has been, what is encouraging awareness into real change on the ground. Nathan, you to? I, I've, got, I've got about a million things to say on it, but um, I'll try, <laughs> take one. I'll, try and, uh, I'll limit it to a couple. I mean, I'm pretty heartened by um, some things, you know, uh, uh, that are happening in politics at the moment. And, you know, Nick Clegg isn't my uh, favourite person for, for many reasons, but actually I think, um, uh, I think it's really great that, that, that he's, he's making mental health a real... Uh, point of, of, of discussion and it doesn't seem to be that he just sort of did it once it feels like it, it's something that he, he he talks about quite a lot and I um and, and I think that's uh, that's great that it's become part of the the, the kind of um, uh, mainstream conversation uh, I'm also uh, a bit old-fashioned uh, and tend to try and judge politicians on what they do not what they say and and uh, you know as Paul says you know the, the rhetoric is one thing but this rhetoric is happening uh, at a time where you know under this under this government we've seen since 2010 we've seen you know thousands of bed closures we've seen thousands of job losses we've seen something representing a six percent reduction in services well there's been a 30 percent increase in in uh, uh, in demand and uh, you know uh, uh, John has already stated, and I'd be so interested to have the conversation. We can have this conversation <laughs> afterwards. Very uh, ambivalent uh, about the closures. I don't, you know, now is, um, uh, for me, I, I feel, you know, now's not the time to be campaigning for bed closures. That's happening all, all by itself. And actually, now's the time to be campaigning very strongly that the money needs to be put into the services, the kind of money that is going in, the sort of 40 million that was promised uh, by Nick Clegg a, a little while back. You know, this doesn't even bring us up close to the levels that we were at when they came into, uh, into government. We're nowhere near uh, parity between mental health and, and, and physical uh, physical health. So um, it's good. It's good we're having the conversation, but that conversation needs to be backed up by uh, real action and money. Okay, uh, can, John. And can, then, can, uh, I, can I chip in uh, something? Um, I'd, I'd love to have Nick Clegg here actually for this because <laughs> I, I think in some ways I would like the debate not necessarily always just to be about mental health services but yeah. to be about things like poverty and inequality because mental health outcomes do track those very very closely. And, you know, the notion that the solution is necessarily always in mental health services, I think, can be a little bit misleading. I'll give you one very short example. Last week, I was sure. just listening to the news on the way home. There was um, a study suggesting a, a small spike in suicide rates, but a larger spike among older men. And there was also a story about under-resourcing in mental health. It's really tempting to put those two things together, but there's a lot of different ways to see and address that suicide rate issue. Poverty, inequality, the role of men, unemployment. There's all sorts of ways of seeing that. And, so, uh, and mental health is not necessarily the only or even the dominant solution when you're looking at something like that, I think. Okay. Sarah, the last word. Um, I would certainly agree with, with John that I, th I see some political debate about mental health and... Again, mental health is seen in terms of mental health services, which are then seen in terms of the NHS. And I know many people who live with mental health problems who won't go near statutory mental health no, services because they've, in, in the past they've, they've found them unhelpful or inaccessible or damaging. And people are finding their own solutions to managing uh, their mental health. And I think that needs to be taken incredibly seriously and different different models of crisis care and help need to be invested in and explored as well um, to bring mental health into the mm. 21st century maybe even the late 20th century yeah okay I'm very sorry so we're just beginning to warm up to uh, <laughs> I got no 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 that was a very good point it was about the affordability and whether people can access the services there are people around who've got the skills or whether people can access those I think it's a very good point now I've got four things to say to finish please uh, so listen firstly there is another thing going on here at the festival after this one in this room so we need to get out pretty speedily uh, number two thank you very much indeed for coming very good audience very participative audience thirdly I'm sure the speakers will be happy to hang around and talk to you 
you a bit or sign books or autograph your T-shirts, whatever else, but um, <laughs> can you do it outside? And then fourthly, can we thank the speakers for brilliant presentations? <laughs>